Originally called Decoration Day, Monday's holiday honors all soldiers who died during service to the nation. Memorial Day was declared a national holiday through an act of Congress in 1971, and its roots date all the way back to the Civil War era. Unlike Veterans Day, Memorial Day honors all military members who have died, who have died and while serving U.S. forces. Today's not Veterans Day, amen? amen. It's for the fallen soldiers. It's for the heroes. We're all heroes. All service members are heroes, first responders, heroes. These are the ones that have died in battle defending the freedom we enjoy today. Amen. One of the first Decoration Days was held in Columbus, Mississippi on April 25th, 1866 by women who decorated graves of Confederate soldiers who perished in the battle at Shiloh with flowers. On May 5th, 1868, three years after the Civil War, the tradition of placing flowers on veterans' graves was continued by the establishment of Decoration Day by the Organization of Union Veterans, the Grand Army of the Republic. General Ulysses S. Grant presided over the first large observance of about 5,000 people in Arlington Cemetery, Virginia, 1873. The orphaned children of soldiers and sailors killed during the war placed flowers and small American flags atop both Union and Confederate. Let me say it again, both Union and Confederate. This tradition continues to thrive in cemeteries of all sizes across the country until World War I. Civil War soldiers were the only honored to this holiday. Now, all Americans who, all Americans who have lost their lives in battle are honored. Grant believed the Memorial Day should, be, should occur when flowers are in full bloom. That's why we have it at the end of May, because he said we need to do it while flowers are in full bloom. Go ahead and roll the video.
God bless America. Don't be confused. Those are heroes. No matter what the world's trying to tell you and show you, those are true heroes. Amen. We're here today speaking English, worshiping the Lord because of sacrifice. Everybody say sacrifice. sacrifice. They sacrificed everything. Not what just they had, but what they could have had. There was moms, dads, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives that laid it all on the line for us. Those are true heroes. So we're about to say and rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. And when we do that, we need to remember and say it with honor. We need to say it with boldness because sometimes it's easy to forget where our freedom came from. Amen. Amen. Everybody rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen, church. Amen. Hey. Amen. You may be seated. Today we're going to talk about remembering the sacrifice. Number one of our fallen heroes to the ultimate example of sacrifice, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. John 15, 12 says, This is my command, my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. We are called to love everybody. We don't have to like everybody. Some people are hard to like. My wife last week said, babe, it's really hard to like you right now. I said, I understand that. I said, but I love you. She said, I love you too. Well, that's good. Love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has none th than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. There's a table set right here. If you go into any chow hall in a military base, if you go to VFW, if you go to American Legion, they all have this table set right here for the ones that didn't make it back home alive. Today we remember them. This weekend we remember them, and we should. But it shouldn't just be this weekend. Amen? Amen. Are we all proud Americans every day? Yes. We should live like it, right? <laughs> After 9-11, there was flags everywhere. There was flags everywhere. It shouldn't take a tragedy for this country to stand up and be patriotic. It shouldn't take an act of terrorists for us to band together, to be united. We are the United States of America for a reason, right? Amen? Jesus is talking uh, to his disciples here. Greater love has none than this, that one lay down his friends. You are my friends if you do what I have commanded you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. Thank you, Lord. For all I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. I don't know if you know this, but a good friend, when he has good news, he's going to share it. A good friend, when he wants to encourage you and celebrate with you, he's going to do it. He's not going to be jealous. He's not going to be jealous. They're going to celebrate your victories. They're going to encourage you. They're going to tell you the good news of Jesus Christ. A good friend isn't going to tell you what you want to hear. I'm going to tell you that right now. A good friend is going to tell you what you need to hear. Amen. I said, babe, does this look good? Can I go on public? She goes, no, you can't. You look silly. <laughs> I didn't want to hear that, but I needed to hear that. A good friend tells you that they're proud of you. A good friend tells you that you're doing a good job. If you don't have those friends in your life, you need to get new friends. Amen. Again, you may not want to hear that, but you needed to hear that. You need good friends in your life, and what a better friend than Jesus Christ. Amen. You are my friends. If you do what I command you, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and your fruit should abide. Bear fruit. Show me you're a Christian. Quit talking it. Quit talking it. Show me that you're a Christian. On, on TV, there's all kinds of athletes and, and actors. Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. Really? Are you, is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? I don't hear that too much. Right. Are you a Christian? Really? How do you act on Monday? How do you act in traffic? I'm preaching to myself on that one. Oh, my goodness. Traffic's from the devil. I believe that. 
Or right, how about that person when you're pulling into McDonald's and you're, you're next in line and that car from the side gets it? Oh, man. That, I was supposed to be next. That was my burger. But now I have to wait behind them. Yeah, you got to love them too. Your fruit should abide. Abide means remain. My son is all about Top Gun right now with a new movie out, and he wants to go see the new movie. And again, I'm not a Tom Cruise fan at all. I don't believe in his theology and all. What, but here, here's, I like the movie and what it represents about our country and about our fighter pilots, okay? Eat the meat, spit out the bones. So he's all about, so he had to watch the first one, right? You had to watch the first one. We watched Rocky 1. We needed to watch all the Rockies, right? So we watch, now he's all about a wingman. He's all about the wingman. Him and Sadie are riding the bikes in front of her house the other day, and he keeps going straight, and Sadie whips off. And he goes, Sadie, don't leave your wingman. Don't leave your wingman. She goes, what are you talking about? You see, in life, we've got a wingman. His name is Jesus Christ. Right? You probably know where I'm going with this. You see, and when we stay with our wingman and we follow our wingman, everything's good. We've got, we're, we're good. But a lot of times we, we may see a squirrel or this or that, and we leave our wingman and we're out there all by ourselves. But, but thanks be to God that when we get our heads clear and we get out of our way and we come right, our wingman's always there. He hasn't diverted, we did. And we're going to talk about freedom today. Anybody like freedom? Anybody? Okay, I, I really like freedom. I don't like anybody telling me how to live or how to raise my family. I'll tell you that right now. I like freedom. Let's pray for the tithe and we'll get into the message. So, Lord God, as we pick up the tithe, we thank you for the true heroes of this nation, the heroes that have gone before us defending the very freedoms we have today. Lord God, we ask um, protection and blessings upon their families. Let us never forget where we came from. Lord God, we know this is a true Christian nation, and what we need to do as Christian people is get on our knees, turn from our wicked ways, and repent. And, Lord, we know that you will bless our nation once again. So, Lord, we ask for blessings upon the tithe. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Give a round of applause to the Lord this morning. <laughs> freedom is a good thing. No matter what the TV and everybody else tells you, freedom is a good thing. You are an adult. You should be free to make up your own mind. Right. You hear a lot of things on the news. You hear a lot of things on TV. You're an adult. Process them and then make an adult decision. Don't let somebody else decide what you need to do for you and your family. Makes sense, really, if, if you ask me. Because I know the people that died for this red, white, and blue flag right now, Amen. they didn't die so we could live in bondage. Right. They, didn't, they didn't die so we could be held captive by fear and anxiety and depression. And most importantly, we have a Savior that died at the cross for our sins so we don't have to deal with the stuff we used to deal with. John 8, 31 through 38. Again, I told you I love freedom, and we're going to talk about freedom and sacrifice today. I hope that doesn't offend anybody. If it does, you need to go to a different place. <laughs> we tell the truth in this church. Right. And like I told the service before, Pastor Pat tells the truth from this pulpit. I can't let the standard drop. Right. I've got to tell the truth. It may offend you. It may step on your toes. But that lets you know in the right, you're in the right place. Right. I'm telling you what you need to know, not what you want to know. I'm not going to pat your bottom, right, like Pastor Pat says. We're all adults. We can all have adult conversations. 31, so Jesus said to the Jews, and this is right after the woman was caught in adultery, and the Pharisees were trying to call out her sin, and Jesus walks on the scene and sets everybody straight. You want your life set straight? Put Jesus on the scene. He starts talking to the Pharisees. He says, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, the ones that actually believed in him, if you abide, remain in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you what? Free. 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 If you want to be free, you need to be told the truth. Right. The truth, I'm going to tell you right now, for the most part, does not come from the TV. Unless you're listening to a word preacher like Billy Graham or D.L. Moody or Charles Spurgeon, some, some truth-telling people, you're probably being lied to. Right. They're telling you what they want you to hear. Again, you're an adult. Listen, make an adult decision. All right, does this sound like they're trying to better me, my family, or my country? No. Okay, well, then I don't need to listen to that. That's not truth. 
Where do I find truth at? I didn't find truth at the bottom of a bottle. Anybody find truth at the bottom of a bottle? No. I didn't. No. Um, I didn't find truth in drugs. Didn't find truth no. in drugs. Anybody find truth in drugs? No. No, just one. Devil. Yeah, amen. Yeah. Let's see here. Sex, drug, rock and roll, they all let me down. There's no truth in all that. I was lied to believing that that's the way that you're supposed to live. That's the way that you're supposed to live. That's freedom right there. There's no freedom in handcuffs. I'll tell you that right now. I didn't feel free in handcuffs. Anybody else feel free in handcuffs? Anybody? Okay, just checking. If you abide in my word, if you want Jesus Christ to have your back, stay with him. There's going to be distractions. There's going to be people that tell you not to do this, not to do that, not to follow Jesus. It's boring. I've been saved for about 12 years now. I've had the time of my life. I've never had a better life than right now. Freedom is not waking up from a drunken stupor. That's not freedom. Freedom is not trying to run from the police or run from your past. That's not freedom. That's bondage. That's shackled. Jesus Christ died so you may be free. We are a Christian nation based on principles that are of a free people. We came from tyranny to be free. People forget that because it's not taught in schools anymore. It's my job to teach my kids about Jesus Christ. It's my job to teach my kids about the red, white, and blue and where we got our freedom and how it's our job to preserve it. We got out of the car this morning, and I said, Brock, we need to lower the flag to half mass. He said, why do we do that? I said, to honor all the people that have died fighting for our country. So before I even get out of the car, he's standing at the position of attention, saluting the flag. Okay? That, that's good. But here's the thing. If, he, if I didn't tell him to do that, he wouldn't do it. Don't count on the schools or the government or anybody else to teach your kids about where we came from. They're trying to erase it. If you erase history, you're doomed to repeat it. Amen? Amen. So, if I want my son and my daughters to learn about Jesus Christ, I need to teach them. Yes, they come to Sunday school. They go to children's church. They do a great job. Uh, they go to a Christian school. But if my kids don't know about Jesus, I'm not blaming the church. I'm not blaming their school. It's my job. Amen? We're parents, right? We're grandparents. It is our job to raise our kids in the ways of the Lord. It's our, ki our job to raise our kids to be proud of the country that they were born in. Amen? Amen. Johnny Cass said, he goes, Brock goes, why do people burn flags? I said, well, buddy, like the late, great Johnny Cass said, he said, there's been people that have died so people can burn flags. But as an American, I also have a right to shove my foot somewhere if they burn my flag. <laughs> Amen? Right? 33, they answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. I, if you read the Old Testament, it's pretty clear that the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt, so quick to forget their past. Amen? Amen? They said, oh, we were never slaves. Yes, you were. Look at your history. You were slaves. We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is that you say you will become free? You ever notice that some people actually think they're free, but they're not? They're, they're, take an example. I have a buddy that was in prison, and he goes, man, when I got out, I thought that was freedom, and I found myself going right back in. I would rather be shackled up than deal with what's going on out here. Kind of sounds familiar. You go to the Old Testament. The Israelites started complaining about their freedom. We have people today that complain about this flag. It's offensive. Number one, let me tell you something. The word of the Lord is very offensive. It's going to point out your flaws. I promise you that. Nobody's perfect. You see, when Jesus Christ came, he came to die for everyone. Nobody's special. Your mama maybe told you you're special, but <laughs> my mom told me I was an angel. My sister says, you have no idea what that kid did. Amen. <laughs> 34, Jesus, Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices, practices sin is a slave to sin. Raise your hand if you like being a slave. Then let me ask you something. How come, even though we're born again and we know what we're supposed to do, and even the Apostle Paul, Romans chapter 7, 
himself says, it is no longer I who does it, but the sin nature that dwells within inside of me. We go out day after day and we know what we're supposed to do, but yet we take the pressures, the anxiety, the fears, what the world wants us to think, and we take it and we push it down further and further and further and further until finally we can't take it anymore. It all comes out. Anybody had one of those days before? It's called pressure. The enemy puts pressure on you. He tries to subdue you and distract you with this and that and this. And again, all we need to do, if we could just keep our eyes on the plumb line, which is Jesus Christ, we'd be okay. But I have yet to meet a person that has said, you know what, once I got saved, I never sinned again. Never. Now, I've heard people say, I was born a Christian. Anybody heard that one? You go to church, yeah, I was born a Christian. Uh, liar. <laughs> Uh, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains in the house forever. So if the son sets you free, what's it say, class? You are free indeed. Don't let anybody lie to you. You are free. Number one, you are spiritually free if you have the blood of Jesus Christ residing over your life. That's most important. Number one, get spiritually free. And number two, you live in the greatest country in the world. No matter what the news says or what everybody else says, you live in the greatest country in the world. You do. Without a doubt. I've been on the other side. We're lucky. Lucky. There's people in China that have to rip up Bible verses, put it in their shoe, meet underground, put the verses back together to make three or four sentences. That's how they have to worship the Lord. That's sacrifice, knowing that if they get caught, they're probably going to get killed. That's sacrifice. We get worried if it's not cold or hot enough or if the chairs aren't padded. Thomas Clatt, a great preacher that I like to listen to every once in a while, he said, I've got 20,000 people in my church. I told them the next week, and there's no chairs, no AC. We had 46 people show up. 46. He averages 20,000. Freedom. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are an offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. Brock asked me another question. He is in a question mode. He's 10 years old, questions everything. But he's got some good questions. Dad, how come everybody doesn't accept Jesus? I said, son, I can't answer that. I said, but what I can do is we can pray for those people. And I said, Rocky, I'm going to tell you something. I said, Daddy wasn't always a Christian. Daddy wasn't, you didn't, you didn't see the other side of Dad. He was young before I got, no, actually, he wasn't even born when I got, uh, I, so long ago I can't remember anymore. <laughs> Thank the Lord for remembering. But I said, Daddy wasn't always like I am today. And, and I think we can all say that. I said, buddy, Daddy had to come repentance too. I said, we all have to come to repentance. I said, all those people out there doing the crazy things, the bad things, I said, you need to pray for those people. I said, because we're, we've all been lost in our own sin, whatever that sin is. We've all been lost. We've all been beaten. We've all been broken. We've all maybe been to the bottom of the bottle or bottom of the pill bottle or whatever it is, tried to find peace wherever we could find it. And then eventually we find out, you know what? The only thing, the only person, the only the only God that can save me, it's not a little G God bottle or not a little G God drug. It's the big G God. It's Jesus Christ. That's where I find my peace. That's where I find my life. Amen? Amen. There's freedom in Christ. If you are not free, try Jesus. I guarantee you've tried everything else. Jim agrees. <laughs> Hebrews 9, 11 through 14. So uh, I, I told the last service, I had a message already, and the first part of the message was great. And then I get back home last night, and God changes the message on me. I said, God, you understand, I've already got the message done. I've already got it picked up. You know, God, I've got this. And God said, get out of the way and let me work. I said, okay. So when Pat says it, get, it was getting sticky, you know, he says it's going to get sticky in here. I literally got sticky last night studying this word that I'm about to preach to you. I had to take my shirt off. It was getting sticky because the whole, I don't know if you guys felt this before, but when you get the Holy Spirit down on you, it gets pretty sticky. 
you get this feeling of warmth that you and God are seeing eye to eye. You know, because sometimes God's looking me straight in the eyes and I'm like squirrel and all this other stuff. I'm focusing everywhere but on God. And God, if you just focus on me, son, I will set you straight. I said, all right, Lord, me and you, me and you. And this is, he brought me, to, I go, God, don't you know, I'm not in Hebrews. I've got a different message plan. Don't you, you ever find that some kind of frustrating when you've got a plan and God gets in the way? Anybody else find that? God, you don't understand. Let me handle this one. He said, yeah, I've seen you handle this one. That's why you're in the spot you're at. Amen. And that's why we're in all church today. Okay. Hebrews chapter 9, I'm going to start off in 11, give you a little backstory before the, the main meet. But when Christ appeared, I'm in 11, 1, um, I'm sorry, Hebrews 9, 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then though through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places. So what that means is the holiest of holies, the main priest, they would have to go up into the great room uh, and, and, and provide a sacrifice for the sins of all the people every year. And Pat told you last week how they have to wrap a rope around him. That way, if he died while he was in there, they could pull him back out because only that one high priest could go in there. But he had to go in there year after year after year after year. It says, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of the goats and calves, but by, me by means of his own blood. He says, I don't need goats and, and birds and cattle blood. You need my blood. That sacrifice just covers the sin. It's like putting a Band-Aid on. You need something. You need the blood of the pure, spotless lamb to get rid of the sin. Amen. Listen, in your lives, don't just put the sin to the side. Get rid of it. Why do you keep picking it back up? The anger, the hate, it's great to give it up. Lord, I'm gonna, please help me take this anger. Then why do you keep asking for it back? The fear, the anxiety, the nervousness. Why do you keep taking it back? Sunday, you lay it down. Monday, you're putting it back on when you get dressed for work. I told somebody that we're counseling, I said, there's a guy, he goes home every night and he takes off this thing and he puts it right here and he goes in the house. And then he comes back out the next day he takes it and he puts it back on. And I said, you know what that represents? He says, what? I said, whatever that went on that day doesn't belong in that house. You take off whatever happened in that day and you hang it up and you go in that house. And nine times out of ten when you go back up to pick it the next day, it's not there anymore. Because it's not important. When you lay stuff down at Jesus' feet, leave it down there. I don't know about you, but I got a bad back. I can't keep reaching down and picking up all this stuff. I let, Jesus, can I just have this hate? Just give it back for about three minutes. I just need to be angry at this person for about three minutes. It'll make me feel better. No, it doesn't. It makes you feel worse. I promise you that because you're like, I, I should have never done that. Quit laying it down and picking it back up. There's no freedom in that. That's called bondage. And you can be a born-again believer and still be in bondage to a certain sin. You are redeemed from that sin, but it's still eating you up inside. Can anybody agree to that? All right, I got a couple honest people today. All right. For if the blood of goats, verse 13, and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh. So what it's talking about is whenever somebody was around a corpse back then, they would have to leave the city gates and they'd have these, these um ashes that they would throw on you to get rid of the, the smell and to purify your physical flesh. Well, then Jesus goes on to say, how much more will the blood of Christ himself, who through the eternal offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Did you know we serve a living God? Yeah. Our, our, our God's not dead. The God is not dead. You call, you call on all the other names, the, the Muhammads, the Allahs, the Gandhis, they're all dead. I don't see that I, they're not living anymore. And that, again, that may wreck some of the theology. And yes, I have read some of this stuff in other books when I was over in the Middle East because I didn't believe in God. I was just trying to figure out what this whole world was about. We serve a living God, a loving God, one that can rescue sinners just like us. Because my sin is no worse than your sin, and your sin is no more worse than my sin. He died for us just the way we are. Thank God for that. 
Verse 23, and I'm going to go ask Miss Carol, you can come on up and go ahead and bring the house lights down. This is where it gets sticky. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear. I'm going to tell you what you need to hear. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Here we go. For Christ has entered not into holy places with hands, which are copies of true things, but into heaven himself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Who's speaking on your behalf? Anybody ever been in court before? Do you have one of those lawyers that you're like, oh, man, I know I'm getting in trouble for this thing. There's no way this guy's going to get me out of this one. See, Jesus speaks to the, to the Lord on our behalf. Right now, right now, if there's still time, you can still have him on your side speaking on your behalf. There's still time. But ask me if tomorrow's guaranteed. No. There's 19 children that learned tomorrow's never guaranteed. There is 19 sets of parents wishing they had one more minute with their baby. Don't tell me this world hasn't gone crazy. Now, was it to offer himself, what's that say, repeatedly? How many times do we put Jesus back up on that cross? How many times do we pick up that sin, that hate, that anger, that jealousy, that, that judgment, whatever it is, whatever is, pl pl whatever is plaguing your life, how many times are you going to pick it back up and put Jesus back on the cross? Like, you know what? Lord, I know you died, but I just, I just need this back for a second. That's not what Jesus, that's not why he died, not for you to go back over and over and over. That is called shackles. That's called being a slave to your sin. There's no freedom in that. There's no freedom in somebody trying to tell me where to stand, where to go, how to talk, how to act. There's no freedom in some. I'm a grown man, you're a grown man, you're a grown woman. You can decide that on your own. That's what freedom is. You need to be, number one, spiritually free by the blood of Jesus. And number two, know that you are physically free by the red, white, and blue, by the men and women that have died and sacrificed their lives so you can be free. Don't live in bondage spiritually or physically. There's no freedom in that offered himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. Verse 26. For then he would have to suffer repeatedly. Repeatedly. Anybody have kids that always get hurt? They got broken bones. They got scars. This. How many times do you have to say, will you stop hurting yourself? Stop doing that because you're hurting me more than you're hurting yourself. How bad do you think it hurts the Lord when he has to see his son? When he sees us sinning, Jesus Christ died so you could stop doing that. Whatever that is, stop going back over and over and over and picking it back up. If you're going to give it up, give it up. Now is the time to give it up. Tomorrow you're going to say, you know what, I wish I would have stopped that yesterday. Stop today, whatever it is. Or start today, whatever you need to start. And hopefully it's living for the Lord more. They asked Billy Graham, if you could do one thing over in your life, what would you do more? Pray more. That's what he said. He said, I would pray more. We can all get closer to the Lord. For then, verse 26, he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all. It doesn't matter if you're rich, you're poor, you're black, you're white, you're skinny, you're tall, you're short. It doesn't matter. Romans 10, 13 says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't matter who you've wronged. It doesn't matter where you've been. Jesus Christ died for you. It is a very personal relationship. It's not about this and that and this. If it was, I, I'll be honest, I wouldn't be born again. That's too many rules. No, he said, I just want you to have a personal relationship with me. With me. But as, is, as it is, he appeared once for all at the end of ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Here's my question. Here's, here's my question for you. Would you give up your child for your, sac for your sins? Would you give up your own flesh and blood 
for your sins. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. I don't know if you know this or not, and contrary to some people, Jesus Christ is coming back again. He is. I, I promise you that. And if you're doubting, you need to read the book. Read the book. Jesus Christ will come back again. And remember, like I said, he's still available right now to be on your behalf. But when he comes back the second time, it's not like that. Tomorrow is never guaranteed. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is the day that you need to make that choice. If you have not made that choice, we all know you made a choice. You can't say, well, Jesus, I, you know what? I was going to get back to you on that. It's not too late. Nope, too late. You had your chance. Don't walk out these doors without accepting the free gift of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of breakthroughs. Today is the day of freedom in your life. Whether spiritual or physical, you need freedom in your life. If you're looking for a breakthrough, get Jesus in your life. If you're looking for freedom, get Jesus in your life. If you're looking for mercy, grace, love, get Jesus in your life. Uh, everything else that you try and, and fill that gap in your void in your life will not work, I promise you. There's a church full of people here that can attest to that. I mean, that's why we're all here today, right? Because everything else failed. If it would have worked, we probably would have just stuck with it, I think. This is why we come to church, we is because we believe that there's freedom in the name of Jesus Christ today. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin. Again, he's already done that. He says it is finished. He's already dealt with the sin issue. You just have to, have to call on his name. You have to accept him as Lord and Savior. And your sin issue, uh, when it comes to eternity, is dealt with. But then, like the Bible says, you have to continue to bear good fruit. Stop acting like a heathen when you're trying to live for Christ. Not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. I don't know about you. I don't know when Christ is coming back. And anybody that says they do, they're a liar. Don't listen to them. But I want to be eagerly waiting for Jesus when he comes back. Amen. I want to be doing his work. I don't want Jesus to catch me picking up some of my old stuff. They're like, dude, what are you doing? Your, your dad ever tell you that or your mom? Dude, what are, you, what are you doing? You know better than that. What are you doing? The Apostle Paul, again, in Romans 7, he goes, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I find the sin in nature. But thanks be to Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for loving a wretch like me. Amen? So Brother BC is going to come up here, and he's going to give an altar call. And again, my prayer, our prayer today, collectively as a church, don't walk out these doors without knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Be free today. Accept the free gift of freedom that is available today spiritually and physically. Amen.